Hello? Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Hola. Uh, my name is Stephanie. I am a product manager at Airbnb. <coughs> oh, excuse me. And uh, I specifically work on building mobile development tools. Uh, in a previous life, I used to work at Facebook, where I was a technical program manager for a couple years, working in a very similar space uh, on developer infrastructure. And today, I will be talking to you all about building for mobile, uh, lessons and stories from the very early stages of mobile all the way to current day. Can I get my deck on the screen, please? Cool, awesome. So with that said, let's get into it. Uh, as far as how our time together is going to go today, um, we will first cover a little bit more about the evolution of mobile as a major computing platform. And then from there, we'll go and actually deep dive into a couple of different companies I've gotten the chance to get to know a little bit better and talk about how both of them have actually been able to deal with and address and answer this mobile question and challenge and, and opportunity. So with that, let's get into it. Uh, a little brief history lesson, um, talking a little bit more about mobile. So when we think about the very early stages of mobile, right, um, it all started with the very first mobile phone. This was the Motorola Dynatech 8 8000X. It was the very first mobile phone that was ever created. It was launched in uh, earlier than some of us might think in 1983. And at the time, uh, as you can see, it was basically the size of a brick. You could only talk on it for around 30 minutes before its battery inevitably died. And it also cost $4,000, uh, which, you know, in inflation adjusted terms, is probably even much more than that now. So by today's standards, that's not very impressive, right? 30 minutes, what can that really get you? But at the time, this was considered hugely revolutionary, right? This was the very first time you could make a call to anywhere in the world without needing to be tethered to a landline, to a device, without needing specific wires to actually make this call. And so it, this was actually considered a widely successful phone where there were thousands of people that were on the waiting list to buy this. And so ever since then, um, ever since you know, 1983, when this was first launched, hardware for mobile devices has continued to evolve over time, uh, where devices have, have gotten from the point of you know, being the size of a brick to something that has grown smaller and smaller to the point where these phones can now fit within our pockets. In addition to that, these phones have also added much more processing power, right? Uh, which have also enabled us to uh, do all sorts of functionality and capabilities that we would never have imagined uh, many years ago. And so some interesting notable milestones on the evolution uh, of, of mobile devices and hardware. There is this really popular Nokia model, which was extremely popular in the early 2000s. And then, of course, there's the iPhone, which we can never forget, uh, which was not the very first smartphone by any means, but did represent a huge revolutionary breakthrough when it came to touch controls and inputs on a mobile device. Prior to this, you know, phones were, for the most part, you only inter interface with them through buttons, through a keypad, and that really limited how you're able to interface with apps, with the internet, with your phone as a whole. And instead, with the iPhone, you get this full screen, beautiful touch screen for the very first time, which allows you to unlock a world of possibilities that are now possible on a mobile device because you now can interface with it in a much more granular, uh, specific way. And so from here on out, you know, I think we're much more familiar with the evolution that happened after the iPhone was launched. Uh, you know, obviously phones have continued to get thinner and thinner. Screens have gotten larger and larger. Um, it almost sometimes feels like things have gone all the way back around again, where, uh, you know, we had flip phones way back in the day, and we see uh, manufacturers actually starting to do flip phones with touch screens and all kinds of crazy things like that. And so in the meantime, as this hardware evolution is happening, there's a very uh, parallel software fight that is happening at the same time across and between all these different major tech players uh, that all want a piece of this mobile software pie. Um, everyone wants a chance to own and operate the next major software computing platform. 
And so even though now, right, we're here in 2020, these fights are largely over, we have a pretty good sense of who has won, way back when, 10 years ago, that fight and that outcome of that fight was not clear at all. Uh, there were all these different players that were trying to, uh, you know, get uh, a stake in this, and we'll cover uh, some of the casualties along the way. Uh, some of you might have remembered, but maybe not, um, in the early 2000s, uh, Microsoft actually lobbied really hard to uh, get a seat at the table and really make a, a stand when it uh, came to the different mobile platforms out there. Uh, they did so with the second iteration uh, of their mobile platform, which was called Windows Phone. Uh, but the challenge that they ran into, that all platforms inevitably run into, is trying to build up that initial traction to get that platform going in the first place. The thing with platforms is that they're ultimately two-sided networks, right? Uh, two-sided ecosystems where you have developers who actually work to create and write the apps uh, for the platform on one hand, and then you also have users who are actually going to use the platform on the other hand. The challenging thing, though, that we run into is that oftentimes, these groups oftentimes don't want to move without the other one being there first. And so hence, you run into this really challenging chicken and egg problem where you need one party to go first, but no one wants to go, and it's hard to actually really get that started. And so uh, oftentimes, you know, uh, developers specifically, though, they want to make sure that they, there's going to be a stable, large enough, healthy enough user base of users to make sure that uh, you know, they're going to get a return on the investment they're going to make by building this app. And then on the other hand, users also want to make sure that uh, you know, there is a healthy, vibrant app ecosystem so they can make sure that if they're going to make that leap of faith and switch platforms, they can actually from there on out, you know, make sure that they have all the apps and all the functionality that they want to do on their phone. So the issue that Microsoft ran into, that many people have since run into, is that they were really unable to, even despite all the investments that they made, all the partnerships that they made with companies to create apps and things like that, they were really unable to get that momentum going such that uh, they could really get this platform off the ground. And so as a result, uh, five years ago in 2015, Microsoft ended up pulling the plug on Windows Phone and it no longer exists. On a similar note, Amazon also tried a really similar play around trying to push into the mobile space by launching a specific phone and then also a operating system on top of that. This came in the form of the Fire Phone and the Fire OS, which was a fork off of AOSP or the Android Open Source Project. Uh, but unfortunately, similar to Microsoft, they also ran into similar issues, were not able to get their platform off the ground, and a few months after they launched this effort, that also ended up folding. And so that brings us to the modern day uh, and the winners that we are ultimately uh, right now much more intimately familiar with. Of course, we have iOS uh, from Apple, we have Android from Google, and this has lent itself to this really interesting duopoly uh, and this really interesting set of dynamics that have formed in the mobile space. Of course, we have iOS, right, that has clearly dominated the high end of the market. They have a very small but much more influential, uh, affluential user base of users, whereas uh, Android, on the other hand, has essentially captured the remaining 75% of this market. Uh, this has, and, and basically captured everything else that's left. This has also resulted in a very interesting set uh, of approaches when it comes to monetization as to business models, where iOS on one hand and Apple, they actually end up making most of their money off of the margins that they get from selling iPhones and related accessories like AirPods and things like that, and then also in taking a cut of App Store uh, transactions that happen. On the other side, Android and Google have decided to go in another direction where they're really going much more for scale, right? They want to get as many people using as many of their properties, as many of their services as possible so that they can leverage that data, that attention, and actually use it to sell ads against. So that is effectively where we see ourselves in the modern day. This is the mobile landscape as we see it. This is sort of how it's played out. And we next will go and deep dive a little bit more in talking about one specific company, in this case, Facebook, uh, to talk a little bit more about how they dealt with the emergence of mobile as a major computing platform and how they responded to that. So it starts with uh, sort of the strategic approach 
way back when, if we rewind and go back to you know, the days of th those mobile software wars, it turns out Facebook actually also uh, tried uh, to, you know, Put, a, put its hat into the ring and see if it could also uh, ha own and manage a software platform. They did so by, by taking a, uh, a page out of the Amazon playbook, uh, and they did something very similar where they launched a, a software and device at the same time in the form of Facebook Home, and then also uh, partnering with HTC to create the HTC First, which is known as the Facebook phone. Uh, the idea here was that this was a mid-range stock Android device. It had this Facebook UI skin on top. And the general hypothesis here was that uh, effectively they were thinking that, OK, we'll have these very tight social integrations with Facebook. Um, you have all this social functionality that's baked straight into the phone itself. And we think this will differentiate this phone relative to all the other offerings out there on the market. However, by the fact that many of you probably don't know that this exists or ever existed, uh, and the fact that this no longer exists, um, it clearly uh, it goes to show that that hypothesis was incorrect, and that uh, the when the phone was actually launched, it actually came out to pretty poor reception. There was a lot of feedback around poor performance and the specs of the phone just really not being up to par. And so as a result, uh, Facebook ended up uh, sh shortly after launching this, six months after launch in 2013, it also ended up killing this particular project. One small note, though, um, one silver lining that did come from this project was the chat heads feature. If you use Android, um, you might have seen the chat heads, fe chat heads feature where there are these little bubbles that show up uh, that you can use that actually overlay on top of the OS and all the other functionality that you might be using. This actually originated from the Facebook home days, so there was some degree of, uh, some degree of uh, innovation that did come out of this experiment. Uh, and so, yes, unfortunately, it was dead. Um, the next phase of the Facebook mobile journey um, then con uh, continues with something called the Facebook Creativity Labs. So this was an internal incubator that was started up in 2013. And the idea here was that uh, there was this trend at the time where many companies were going towards the direction of building out app constellations. These are effectively suites of custom apps that are created to help solve for very specific workflows with the idea that uh, the thinking was at the time was that apps were starting to get very large, very monolithic, uh, and to the point where it was very difficult for users to figure out how to navigate through these apps and actually do what they need to get done. And instead, many companies were erring towards the sides of breaking up their apps, creating smaller uh, subset apps that would then solve very specific workflows in and of themselves. And so Facebook very much so uh, took a page out of that playbook, and they launched a number of different apps in a number of different categories. Uh, most notably, this included paper. Um, some of you might have heard about this. This was a newsreader app uh, that essentially would pull all the stories from your newsfeed, combine it, and curate it with a number of different uh, highly ranked stories, and then show them to you in uh, this newsreader app. Uh, this actually pushed the envelope quite a bit from a design perspective and there's actually many parts from paper that we actually still have technology-wise in the main Facebook app today, as far as the way we display notes, the way we do instant articles. Uh, and so that was paper. And then in addition to that, there also were apps like Rooms, for example. This was a, an anonymous chat room app, sort of akin to Secret, which some of you might have heard of from a couple years ago, uh, and also Blind, which is a very similar sort of secret social network uh, that is entirely anonymous that still exists to this day. And then lastly, there is also Riffs, which uh, was more of a tool that people could use to actually build collaborative social video. And this is just a small sampling of all the apps that were created during this period. However, by the fact that most of these apps also no longer exist, many, many of you probably don't uh, know about them or recognize them, many of these apps just also did not find a large enough user base. Uh, and shortly after a couple years uh, in, after this uh, incubator was launched in 2015, uh, we also sh ended up shutting this down.
And so lastly, uh, you know, as all these different phases of evolution are happening, right, we ex we're experimenting with the phone, we're experimenting with these app constellations and these specific apps. Meanwhile, Facebook continues to do a series of really key acquisitions uh, throughout the decade. It starts with Beluga, which it actually ended up being the foundation for what is currently now Messenger uh, in 2011. And then a year after, there was the acquisition of Instagram, really famously, for a billion dollars. And then a couple years after that, uh, there was WhatsApp, of course, which was which made, it, made an even bigger splash uh, in 2014 when it was acquired for $19 billion. And so when we think about the Facebook surfaces on the whole today, right, um, it, it did not end up being a number of diff these different things. It did not end up being a, a phone platform, right, as much as Facebook uh, has wanted to own a platform for a really long time. It did not end up as the set of app constellations and these very hyper-specific custom apps. And it also did not turn out to be one large monolithic app where everything was bundled all in one thing together, sort of similar to the way we see WeChat these days in China. Uh, but instead, Facebook has sort of fallen into some place in the middle of that spectrum where they now actually have a very core set of key surfaces and apps that serve very specific uh, functionality. And Facebook now refers to these apps as a sort of core family of apps. So that brings us to our current day and the major surfaces that we are familiar with. Uh, we'll now sort of take a pivot uh, away from the sort of strategic side of things and talk a little bit more about the technical architecture and uh, the major frameworks that uh, the, main f uh, the major Facebook app has used. And so to start from the very beginning, eight years ago in 2012, when these were first launched, uh, the, the company at the time made a very large, very public bet on HTML5 as the vehicle that they would deliver these apps through. Coming from web, I think it was a very natural uh, decision and a very natural uh, uh, path to go down because coming from a web-based world, they saw the, you know, the promise and the lore of cross-platform and all the benefits that would come with it. Of course, you know, the ability to write code once and run that everywhere. And then also, uh, in addition to that, there is also a lot of draw around being able to decouple the app, uh, the, uh, the release cycle, right, um, from the native mobile release release cycle so that uh, they would instead rely a little bit more on how you end up pushing web code, where you deploy your code and users can start using it right away. This runs extremely counter to the way mobile releases code, which is quite different, where there's a lot more friction from the point at which you uh, submit your code and you want it to go out and to the point where users actually start using it because there are many steps that need to happen along the way. Of course, you need to package your app, you need to submit it to the App Store, you need to get it approved by the App Store, which can take a couple days, and then even from there, the user actually has to then go request that, download that, uh, and actually install that code before it can start running, which can be in the order of, of weeks, if, if at all, ever. And so uh, there are all these benefits to cross-platform that the company really liked. But at the same time, there are also downsides to this, of course, as there are with anything. Uh, one major downside that we see with HTML5 sometimes and with, and with cross-platform specifically is that oftentimes when you architect your code in this way, it can lead to these performance and user experience issues because you are working through this intermediate framework, right, instead of working with the underlying native components themselves. And so ultimately, this was the issue that uh, these Facebook HTML5 apps ultimately ran into, um, where they ran into a whole host of performance issues and user experience issues that they had a really difficult trouble, that they had a lot of trouble debugging and working through. Uh, from one particular uh, notable place where they really suffered was around the area of scrolling performance, where uh, ultimately, when you dig into this specific space, what you end up finding is that in order to have really good scroll perf on one given platform, oftentimes you have to do a lot of tuning and optimizations for that platform specifically and the parameters that are there on that particular platform itself. And so when you're working in this very cross-platform world, oftentimes uh, that, that approach ends up falling down because because the more you optimize for one platform, it ends up resulting in a suboptimal or non-fluid experience uh, for all the other platforms that that code is running on. And so with that, uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, admits uh, a couple months into this particular project that you know, they bet too much on HTML5 and that it ultimately was not going to work if they were going to really invest a lot in mobile. <laughs> 
And so as a result, shortly after, later in 20, 2012, uh, the company really starts to really fully commit to building up uh, these native Android and iOS apps from scratch. Uh, and these apps are actually the foundation of the apps that we now use today um, that uh, eight years later uh, and is what is, we, it is what we are building off of uh, in this day and age. A couple of years later, uh, so we have these native apps on iOS and Android, uh, but a couple of years later, um, spanning from or starting from around 2013 to 2015, Facebook tries their hand at cross-platform yet again, this time with in-house built solutions with React and React Native. To provide some initial context, React is a JavaScript library that you can use to build uh, interactive UI. It is commonly used to help build inter web interfaces. And then React Native is a framework that builds on top of that that allows you to take the logic that you've built out for web and use that to actually render it uh, on a native, in a native context. There is a slight difference, though, when we think about cross-platform solutions and HTML5 versus React Native. HTML5 is a much more pure web approach in thinking about this, where it's a much more simple wrapper around what is effectively a mobile website uh, versus React Native and all of the, the it's sort of sister frameworks uh, is much more closer uh, to working with actual native components themselves. Today, React Native is used across a number of different surfaces within uh, the Facebook family of apps, most notably uh, the Marketplace app uh, within the major app that actually, uh, by and large, mostly uses React Native. Uh, and so similarly, we see a similar benefit here around being able to leverage code that you're writing with one platform and being able to use it in other places uh, and reuse languages that are more familiar to uh, web developers. And so after that, uh, we, we have the next sort of iteration. Uh, so we're now at the point where we're eight years into the, the life cycle of these apps. These apps have gone to the point where they are among the largest apps in the world, both in terms of the size of the code bases themselves, and then also as far as the number of people that are working on these apps um, at the same time. And so we're at the point now where Facebook these days invests a lot of time and energy and resources into building out a lot of uh, both product and developer-facing infra in order to, one, improve the actual product experience of using these apps, but also at the same time to help uh, enhance the developer productivity such that when you're working with an app of this size, of this scale, developers can still be productive, um, even despite how large it is. And so notable examples here include, on one hand, uh, Hermes, which is a custom JavaScript engine that has been built to help improve the performance of React Native apps on Android and help to actually counter effect some of the performance, uh, the performance uh, potential pitfalls of using a cross-platform framework. And then on the other hand, we also have tools like Buck, which is a in-house build system that was created uh, initially for, for Android um, and has now later been ported over to iOS as well. And so we're now at the point in this day and age with, with Facebook where uh, they're, they're dealing with these, this massive amount of scale and have started to devise these solutions to help uh, work around that type of scale. So next, we move from the sort of technical architecture uh, and the different decisions that have been made there on that side and pivot a little bit more to talk about the monetization and business questions that Facebook uh, ultimately had to answer when they made the shift over to mobile. So initially, when this was all happening eight years ago in 2012, uh, there were a lot of open questions as far as how Facebook was going to manage the shift over to mobile and how that was going to potentially impact the way that they made money. Facebook at the time had a really healthy degree of ad revenue coming in from web, uh, and there are many open questions as far as how this was going to translate over to mobile. As you can see, when, you have, uh, when you're working with uh, a web interface, there's much more screen real estate you can work with, right? There's the feed, there, is, there are right-hand column, there's the right-hand column ads. There is a lot more places where you can put ad inventory and a lot more opportunities to show ads. This, when you compare it to the mobile world, is, uh, offers some interesting questions because you have much less space that you need to work with. And so there are these very big questions as far as how Facebook was going to figure out how to make this, this jump without letting uh, you know, their advertising revenue tank. Uh, 
The uncertainty was so big to the point where uh, six months after Facebook had IPO'd as a company, its stock had actually dropped 50% because people were not quite sure how they were going to manage this transition. Fast forward a couple years later, uh, the company continues to introduce things like feed ads. It starts to explore different new formats uh, of ads that can go within this vehicle. One really interesting notable example here is uh, that they came up with was this notion of app install ads. Uh, these days when we see them, it feels, uh, you know, it's something that we're somewhat familiar with, but this actually ended up being a very novel breakthrough way um, for, uh, as far as uh, an ad format, because this allowed app developers essentially to be able to market and promote their apps and find new users, uh, which actually ended up being a really great fit for the mobile gaming industry, actually. Um, so a little bit of an aside, but when you think about the way the mobile gaming industry makes money. Oftentimes, there's a very big head factor where uh, there are a very small number of digital whales, uh, as it were, that essentially are people that are, it's a very small set of users that are highly engaged with the app. Uh, they spend a lot of money on the particular apps. Uh, you know, they're extremely active. And uh, when you think about how much money gets, uh, how much money these, these gaming companies get, a very large percent of it is driven by a very small number of people. And so these app install ads work really well for the gaming industry in the sense that it allows them to target, identify, and find people who are likely going to fall in that bucket and, and find them as users so that uh, they can, can get them onto uh, their particular games. And so when we think about mobile, uh, Facebook and mobile, and how it was able to manage uh, these challenges today, uh, we see that the script has actually almost completely flipped, where uh, way back when, eight years ago, Facebook had uh, effectively all of its revenue on web and nothing on mobile, to the point now where, uh, as of late last year, Facebook has actually booked 94% of its advertising revenue uh, through, through mobile channels. And so next, uh, I wanted to do a really quick note around culture um, and how the, the nature of which uh, Facebook actually develops some of its products. Uh, so when we think about all these different previous phases of evolution, right, from a technical angle, from a strategic angle, from a uh, sort of business angle, we can see uh, a lot of Facebook's culture at play here around the way in which they, uh, you know, really prioritize constant experimentation, lots of innovation, lots of risk taking, lots of trying out of new ideas. And especially, and so when we think about Facebook today, oftentimes we see it as this very large behemoth, right? It's this massive success with all these major apps that serve billions of users a day. But as far as we've seen, right, in you know, the conversation that we've just had, um, Facebook has, it, the path to get to that particular point has not necessarily been very linear. Facebook has had its fair share of you know, epic failures, of bad decisions, of mistakes that it's made along the way. Uh, but ultimately, at the end of the day, they're, they were able to get to the point, where, uh, to the point that they're at today. This is actually one interesting lesson that we can all sort of take personally for ourselves around, you know, in this day and age when we live, uh, you know, more public lives than ever, when it feels like the stakes for failure are, are higher than ever because, uh, you know, it's, it's much more obvious when we do fail. Um, it can be very tempting for us sometimes to go with the safe option, to go with the safe path that no one would ever fault us for. But the examples uh, that Facebook has sort of, uh, you know, uh, shown us here are that there can be a lot of value in, in taking that risk, in taking that leap of faith, because there can be potentially a lot of value in, you know, seeing where you end up after that, because it could end up in a much better place than, than where you started. And so where does that leave Facebook today, right? Facebook is, of course, no longer just an upstart in the mobile space. Uh, it no longer, it's, it's not no longer just a, a sort of fledgling player, uh, but instead is operating one of the largest uh, apps, one of the largest services in the world. And so there are a couple of key areas that Facebook continues to struggle with even to this day. Of course, I mentioned a bunch around the technical scale challenges that uh, we're running into. 
Uh, in my particular space uh, in developer tooling, uh, it's led, this ultimately means uh, building out a lot of in-house solutions uh, and products and services around things like source control, around continuous integration, around the way we do testing, around the way we edit code, uh, because we're at the point now where off-the-shelf uh, components, off-the-shelf solutions from outside vendors no longer work for a company at the scale that we're working at. And then next, uh, uh, with Facebook becoming even more uh, of a central part of our society, there's been much more scrutiny over time around the way in which uh, Facebook creates and moderates policy around things like hate speech, censorship, misinformation, and all kinds of different levels of unsavory speech. The challenging here is that with these particular types of questions, with these particular types of topics, there are oftentimes no very clear right answers. There's just many different layers of gray. And uh, the, the Facebook model of you know, being very iterative, of figuring it out as you go, that model doesn't really uh, translate very well when you're operating at this scale now, when you're governing basically a platform that's used globally, uh, and where you know, the stakes of, of failure are much higher and much more visible. And so that's one thing that they uh, are continuing to wrestle with today, and there are very many open questions as far as how they will address that. Outside of that, um, there are also really interesting questions around quality and testing, um, because Facebook culture, um, it would be surprising, but for a very large company, it actually does not have a lot of process. It actually does not have any very formal QA processes. And instead, right now, they rely a lot off of uh, you know, user testing, off of dog fooding, off of getting feedback from users. And so as Facebook continues to become a more integral service in people's lives, uh, there's this interesting challenge they've had to do, culturally speaking, to figure out how to instill quality into the mobile development workflow and to really uh, install much more robust testing practices in general. And so with that said, that is a little bit about Facebook. And then now we'll sort of pivot and talk a little bit more about Airbnb, which is a company that I've gotten to know a little bit better over the last couple of months that also provides uh, some interesting contrast relative to, uh, to Facebook. And so with uh, Airbnb, Airbnb was also a web-only property. It also jumped onto the mobile bandwagon uh, early, pretty early on in 2012. And uh, at the time, uh, they were, uh, I actually hear from some of my colleagues that some of the first apps were actually very much so built by interns, and some of the foundations of which uh, built by those interns are still in place today. Secondly, also, um, as Swift and Kotlin became, were introduced and became a lot uh, more mainstream in the last couple of years, Airbnb jumped over to starting to use these technologies for iOS and Android pretty early on. Uh, of course, this transition is a lot easier to make, though, when your organization is a lot smaller. Airbnb is, uh, operates on the order of, I think it has uh, less than 200 mobile developers. This is in stark contrast to uh, Facebook, which is still, for the most part, very much so an Objective-C and a Java house, and uh, where they're operating at the scale instead of you know, thousands of developers, where it's much harder to, to move people over. So, Airbnb has you know, these, uh, these native iOS and Android apps. Uh, they also, too, a couple years ago, give, uh, they also try their hand at cross-platform uh, in the form of React Native as well. Uh, the thinking was here that Airbnb at the time, they had far more mobile work to do than they had mobile developers to do it. And on top of that, their web stack was also already using React. And so it was a natural no-brainer for them to go down the React native path uh, and actually start to figure out how they could use more of the web talent that they had and parlay that over to uh, building out more functionality on native. And so they started doing that for a couple years, um, but then uh, as of actually two years ago in 2018, Airbnb ultimately decided to pull the plug uh, on React Native. They actually wrote a couple of interesting blog posts sort of detailing their decision, but the long and short of it was what they ended up finding was that instead of the promise of you know, having one stack to really worry about with, uh, with JavaScript and React, instead they found that they were managing not just one and not just two stacks, but actually three stacks where they had to think about their React and React Native uh, portion of their code in addition to the actual uh, remaining iOS and Android uh, native code that they still had to manage. <laughs> 
And so one interesting general note about cross-platform after having seen all these different companies try these different variations of cross-platform is that React Native and you know, its sister, sister frameworks uh, with Flutter from Google and Xamarin from Microsoft, they all have you know, their sort of place. Um, and it seems like the, the sort of sweet spot for these types of frameworks is when you, know, you have a much smaller app, a much smaller, simpler app, and a much smaller development team to work with. Um, I think it feels like any time you start getting more complex than that in the functionality that you need to have in your app, uh, and, more fun and the larger of a development team that you have, oftentimes it ends up potentially being more work and more complexity than it's worth to manage this interim layer versus just going full native uh, instead. And so lastly, that brings us to the modern day, where you know, we, Airbnb has now gone to the point where they've pulled out all of their React Native code uh, in the code base. And they're instead investing a lot more and doubling down a lot more into this idea of server-side rendering, which allows you to get some of those cross-platform um, benefits without necessarily needing to use a cross-platform framework. The idea here with server-side rendering is that you are still able to leverage the web and the backend for a lot more of that logic and rely less on the client. And you're also able to, once again, decouple yourself from that mobile release cycle. Uh, and the way that it works in a nutshell is that you have you know, your backend, which sends the client uh, data in the form of components to render, the configuration of the screen, some different actions that can occur from that. And, uh, and from there, the client and then takes that data and then renders it uh, on the screen. At Airbnb, the way that they do server-side rendering is through uh, the system called the DLS, which stands for the Design Language System, uh, that uh, is used across both web and, uh, and, and web, or it's used across both mobile and for web uh, in, in actually rendering all of its different visual surfaces. And so as far as the current challenges that Airbnb is currently running into, um, one thing, uh, it's sort of similar to Facebook in the sense that you know, these apps are now eight years into its life cycle. These apps have started to get larger and larger to the point where a lot of this functionality is starting to get very intertwined and very messy uh, and not very well encapsulated. Uh, from a user perspective, it's not quite so obvious, but from a developer productivity angle, this has pretty severe impacts in the sense that developers now have to work on the order of the entire app as opposed to just being able to work on the features that they want to work on. And so this results in, in really uh, very annoying issues around uh, editing, where uh, oftentimes Xcode and IntelliJ can be really slow, or where features don't really work very well, and also in the form of build times, where you now have to build the entire app as you're iterating on a feature, instead of just being able to build your specific feature itself. And so one major initiative uh, we're driving right now to try and fix and solve this is this effort around modularization, around platformization, uh, so that we can better encapsulate these different features, better encapsulate logic so that um, it is well encapsulated in modules that developers can then use and work off of. Uh, this is likely not going to be something that will have a very obvious user uh, impact uh, and, and effect, but this, will, this really will set the foundation for enhanced uh, mobile developer productivity down the road and really set the foundation for that. And so lastly, this brings us to a, fi a couple final notes around culture and how F Airbnb uh, thinks about uh, and gets work done and th how it thinks about product development. And so Airbnb is very famously very design driven. It places a very strong emphasis on, uh, on aesthetics, on design, on the user experience, both in terms of its online uh, surfaces and what those look like in its web product and its, web pro and, and its uh, mobile product, but also in its offline experiences and what that experience feels like when you're in a home, when you're on an experience. Uh, and the thinking behind this is that uh, you know, Airbnb obviously competes in an extremely competitive travel industry, right? Uh, they're competing against uh, all sorts of, of different competitors like hotels, like uh, uh, Expedia, like um, uh, also tour guide operators that are offering experiences. And the thinking is that this attention to detail is ultimately what uh, will help differentiate Airbnb and its offering relative to the other uh, offerings out there on, on the market. And another axis for comparison across uh, 
Airbnb versus Facebook is also on the way both companies think about their product development philosophy. Uh, Facebook is very famously all about scale, right? When you think about designing a new feature, when you think about uh, launching something new, you're very much so pushed and encouraged to think about building for scale on day one. Uh, so for example, when they launched the Friends video feature, they had to work a lot with infrastructure to make sure that you know, we had a scalable way to make sure we had enough capacity to create the videos in the first place, and then also to serve them to all the users that would see them. Uh, and so this is in stark contrast, right, to many other services and companies that you oftentimes see, uh, you know, struggling to keep up with load and, and capacity on the first day of launch. Um, one, I think, more recent example of this is the Disney Plus launch, when they launched the new uh, Disney streaming service uh, that I heard uh, ended up going down in its first couple days because there was just so much demand and so much load that they weren't able to deal with it. And so that is Facebook in a nutshell. They care a lot about scale and making sure that things will work uh, at, at a very large basis. And this is in stark contrast to the way Airbnb thinks about product development, which in fact is almost the complete opposite. Instead, they think a lot more about trying to ideate and brainstorm and think about the ideal perfect experience for a user, even if, even if it will not scale at all, right? Even if it's something that you cannot do on the scale of millions and or even even thousands of users, uh, with the idea that you know you you craft the ideal situation and experience first, and you figure out how you can work backwards and actually work in some of that magic into the product itself. Uh, this ultimately, I think, uh, results in, it, it sort of shows the, the difference in perspective for both companies. Um, Airbnb is very much so about making sure that they've sanded down all those rough edges, making sure that the experience feels as polished as it needs to be, which makes sense, right, when you are dealing with lots of money at stake and, and a travel experience that is not going to come around very often. And this is in comparison to Facebook, where they're much more OK with um, some rough edges in the experience. They're, they're a little bit more OK if the app uh, crashes a little bit more, because it's a much more high frequency product that people keep using. And so with that, um, I think one, one thing that I've learned and one thing that's been very educational for me, having worked at both these companies and experienced both of these different cultures, is that there is no clear universal right answer right, to any of these problems, to any of the strategic problems, to any of the culture problems and questions, and to any of the technical uh, questions as well. It all ultimately comes down to the situation that you're in, the context in which you're operating, and the approach that will work best for that particular scenario. So in the Facebook model, this probably means moving really fast, experimenting a lot, uh, and really designing for scale because, you know, you this is the nature of the product that exists, versus on the Airbnb side, you know, really um, putting the 80-20 the rule aside and really caring about all the different aspects of a particular experience uh, and making sure that experience is as, uh, as ideal and as, a, as perfect as possible. And so with that, that actually concludes the end of my talk. I hope you got some interesting nuggets in there about whether it's the evolution of mobile or uh, you know, some interesting tidbits from the, uh, the evolution of, of Facebook or Airbnb. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, and yeah, I'm open for questions if there are any. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions for Stephanie? Oh, okay. Hi, Stephanie. Hello. Uh, hang on a second. Okay, so with the increase of uh, folding phones in the market, how do we approach um, uh, our existing technology to adapt to this new one? When we think about all these different... Are you saying as far as within these apps how we think about taking yeah. advantage of these different capabilities? Exactly. That's an interesting one. I think there are, I mean, I think we see uh, 
so it really depends, obviously, on the company, right, and the specific area that they're in, what they're ultimately trying to do. We do see a lot of companies really trying to take advantage of, of new tech, right? Um, so one key example that I can think of off the top of my head is with Facebook and you know the emergence of AR, VR as, as a technology. Um, one thing that I've seen, was, there's been some really interesting use cases that I've seen emerge. Obviously, there are the very obvious examples around uh, all the different lenses and filters you now see on uh, not only uh, products like Snapchat, but also you know Messenger and all the all the other Facebook products. Um, but I think some interesting opportunities that I also see are you know being able to leverage that in in other sorts of applications that are maybe a little bit more practical than just communication and entertainment. Um, one related example to that that I, I can, for whatever reason, think off the top of my head is, for example, um, trying on lipstick, right, and, and being able to experience, uh, you know, the art, the, the practice of uh, being able to, you know, try out a new product and see what that might look like on yourself without needing to go to a store. That is something you can now do with AR. Uh, AR. Uh, that is now possible in, uh, in, a, in a number of different apps. Uh, and so I think that it really depends on obvi obviously the different areas that uh, your company and your product is operating in and what that ultimately means. Uh, but yeah, that is one particular area. Uh, another thing that we also see is around ML, right, and, and AI, and being able to do more of that on the devices themselves. Uh, obviously, that is, going to that is going to require still a lot of uh, innovation as far as being able to do a lot more inference uh, in uh, actually edge devices and things like that. Uh, but I think there is a lot of promise there, and uh, I'm very curious to see where that, where that goes in the future. Okay, thank you. Uh, does anyone has uh, questions? No? Okay, then a big round of applause for Stephanie. Thank you.